put your thinking caps on because we are now getting into our conversation. A conversation that we hope will have a lot of impact, not just for the moment of this two hours, but beyond so that we take it away in terms of our work and then our relationships and more further down. Uh, may I now request Mr. Uh, Professor Vinod Menon uh, to please take the floor and, and lead us into the beginning of this conversation. Thank you very much and welcome once again to Rise World Summit. Thank you, Karen. It's a really a great opportunity for us to have all the distinguished resource persons, experts, uh, climate resilience professionals, disaster risk reduction professionals. We have a lot of experts who have come from different parts of the world who are joining this round table. And uh, we have this round table co-hosted by the International Emergency Management Society based in Oslo and uh, the Climate Action Network South Asia, CANSA. And TEAMS is an organization which has been there as a disaster management uh, professionals platform from 1993. And uh, they also have uh, different country chapters and regional directors in different regions, different continents of the world. And uh, uh, Harold, uh, Drago, who is the president of Teams, was a person who initiated along, he is one of the co-founders and a leading spirit. He became the vice president in 1994, continued till 2002. And in 2002, he became the president of Teams. And for the last two decades, he has been the president of Teams. And uh, there have been 28 annual conferences and a lot of activities. So uh, Harold is based in Oslo, in Norway. Uh, and he has, uh, you know, degrees in control engineering from the Norwegian Technical University and also a degree from uh, Purdue uh, in the US. And he has been a consultant to the World Bank, to the uh, IMF, to EU, NATO and many international organizations, multilateral and bilateral organizations. And he's participated and has led many projects in the EU. And I feel that actually, you know, he will be one of the people who will actually be able to provide more in insights. So uh, I would request uh, Harold to uh, share some opening remarks, uh, you know, and launch this round table on climate resilience and disaster resilience in a changing world. Over to you, Harold. Oh, Harold, you're on mute. Yeah. There we go. Thank you, Vinod. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, address you this uh, morning for us in Oslo. So I would say good morning to those in the Western world, uh, afternoon in India and Asia, and even uh, night for some of them who address this early. I'm president of the International Emergency Management uh, Society. And as Vinod said, I address you from a cold Oslo today, minus six with light snow. But we are going towards the uh, spring now, so every day get longer. So that's the good thing. And hopefully this will also be the case with what we do in emergency management and disaster resilience. And I would like to take some few minutes to address you on what is Teams and what do we do in this respect. We are, as said by Vinod, an international NGO. Actually, we are registered in Brussels, but I live in Oslo and have operating that part from Oslo. We are a member organization. We are all volunteers. And we are a forum for education and policy in emergency management and disaster resilience. And this is then a platform where we can communicate on all this very important issue as we see the world is threatened by a lot of disasters. And we have all gone through this uh, pandemic and it's still not over. So this has hurt all of us and hopefully we have learned from it. Teams, we are international uh, and we do this by having chapters in different parts of the world. 
We have 16 chapters at the moment, one in India, one in US, one in South Africa, uh, uh, Australia, Japan, Korea, and some European countries. And you will also hear, hear more from our people later in this session this morning. We have a small secretariat in Brussels. And um, what do we do in order to address these important issues? We have conferences and workshops all over the world. We started out, like Vinod said, back in 93 in USA. We were founded there. And uh, at the moment, we are registered in Brussels, Belgium. Um, the, uh, the annual conference has been moving around the world. Uh, and actually, the last year and the year before, it was supposed to be in Paris. Because of the pandemic, we had to do it virtually. But no, for the next year, we are plan this year planning in the US. And we then have understood that pandemic has changed the world. We need to do it hybrid. We hope we can have people present. That depends how does the pandemic further develop. And secondly, we like, we see also the positive things why with the uh, virtual communication, because more people can attend and they don't have to have high expenses in order in traveling. But of course, we all miss the physical contact, looking our friends in the eyes, taking, touch them and being together. That's what we miss. Other things we do, we started last uh, year with webinars because what we like to do is teach and uh, have a communication on these important issues. So these webinars we ran together with a company called Capacity Building International and we address different issues on global emergency management models. So if any one of you, if you go to our website, I will post that on the chat when I'm finished, you can uh, always uh, suggest to present your country's system or things you do in emergency management disaster resilience. We do research projects funded by, most of them have been funded by the European Union. They have a fund of, for a five year period, the European Union put about uh, 100 billion euro into research. We get a small part when we participate, but it's important funding for bringing things forward. And actually one of the projects we have been doing in the past is Heracles. Heracles was about cultural heritage and trying to protect them from climate change. So the, in that project, which you also find a link to on our website, you can see what we developed a platform and the rules and new material for how can we protect cultural heritage, which we all know is a very important foundation for our future. Uh, what we, we also try to establish what we say a common way of communicating. And therefore we have also launched international certification. We call them teams qualification certifications. We have one for practitioners which have experience in the field and also for academics. And Vinod is one of our um, TQC, which we call the certification, the charter members. And you can also find that on the website. Overall, uh, one of our roles is to promote a common understanding worldwide on system methods operation in emergency management and disaster resilience. So we have a common language when we talk about this. And we then address preparedness, mitigation, response and recovery from disasters, including climate change. Thank you all for giving me this opportunity to address you this morning and several of my directors uh, responsible for different parts of the world, they will address you uh, later today. And I will put the team's website uh, link in the chat and also my, uh, my 
by email. So if you find teams of interest, please contact me or go to the website. Thank you all. Thank you so very much, Harold. I think uh, that is a very expansive view. Uh, and, and I'm sure Teams is, you know, the kind of work and the body of work that has happened is so huge that there is a lot of opportunities for us uh, to take forward, <clears throat> both as part of the roundtable, but also post collaboration, supposed to win collaborations. Um, may I now request Sarabjit to please introduce uh, Tom, Tom White, uh, to say a few words uh, to all of us. Sarabjit. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, I'm happy to invite my colleague uh, and uh, my boss uh, at uh, UNICEF, uh, Thomas White. Uh, Tom is a public health specialist uh, by passion, by uh, formal education. He's also an engineer and he's a committed humanitarian and uh, He's been uh, working around the world uh, uh, in different countries, uh, including Myanmar, many countries in Africa. And now he's here in India, leading UNICEF on child-centered disaster risk reduction and risk-informed programming. So Tom, welcome. Um, over to you. Thank you so much, Sergi. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Professor Vinod. Um, firstly, let me just say, um, maybe I should start with a good afternoon for those in India and South Asia, but also a good evening and even a good morning to, to our colleagues in Oslo <laughs> and elsewhere. So firstly, what an honor it is really to be able to, to speak and have this opportunity to, to share some remarks in this opening session. Um, to have a session on climate change and disaster resilience in a changing world. I think that's probably one of the most pertinent and relevant discussions we could possibly have in, in, in today's day and age. Um, but also, I'd like to um, take this opportunity to, to uh, acknowledge my fellow speakers um, across the panel here as well. So I think, what well, I shouldn't say panel. Um, Karen, I hear your point. Um, but fellow speakers, I, 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 I uh, relish the opportunity for us to, to share this opportunity. Um, so I think I'm going to share a few words on my expectations and even my aspirations for, for today's discussions. I think um, if we think about climate change, if we think about disaster resilience, obviously there's a very strong interconnect. And the fact that the, the world is changing and, and continues to, to change at what I certainly would consider a, a rapidly increasing, accelerating pace. So I think um, that certainly brings on certain challenges. I think climate change combined with COVID-19 over the last couple of years have demonstrated for all of us, both at home and in the workplace, the way in which the world continues to outpace us in terms of risks and impacts versus our ability to forecast, mitigate, and to prepare. I think we can all agree that the discussion around climate change is no longer about whether or not it will happen. It's quite clear to all of us that the multiple impacts are already occurring and that they are accelerating, especially for those most vulnerable and marginalized. We're talking about children coming from UNICEF. It's easy to say that, but I think we can all relate to it. For children, for women, for those with differing abilities, the tribal communities who are often less visible and perhaps least heard. I think if we, if we move from challenges and start looking at our capabilities, I think COVID-19, while it's been an obvious and continues to be an obvious shock for all of us, it's also taught us a lot about how we can be resilient. We've seen the world coming together to generate new tools. We can look at all the diagnostic tools, those rapid tests, the RT-PCR tests, and so on. We can talk about the vaccines, not just one, but multiple vaccines from different providers and how they've all been made available at lightning speed across the planet. Perhaps not available for all those who most need them, but they're available. It's up to the rest of us to make them available for those who most need them. We've seen the world come together to generate these tools. And also to be much more creative and innovative 
in the way that we contribute to global emergencies. We've seen how manufacturers initially put out of business by the pandemic containment measures, suddenly finding new niche opportunities where they could actually contribute to the global response. For example, producing the personal protective equipment, the PPE, you know, like the face masks or the visors, all these things that were pretty niche type things at the beginning of the pandemic, very few producers, all of a sudden, those kind of copyright and patents made available for so many others to engage and support the response. This kind of innovation and open mindedness and willingness to engage in a human race type response is also what is required right now by all of us to seek ways in which we as individuals and more widely as a global community can accelerate and contribute to what is essentially an existential crisis. We must challenge ourselves as to how we can contribute and what capabilities we can offer now, but also in the medium and longer term. So how do we collaborate? I think we can all confidently say that we all have a role to play. We have a role to play in greening whatever we do, reducing our individual and collective carbon footprints, but also in adapting and helping others to adapt to this changing world as climate change accelerates and its impacts broaden. Those impacts are broadening far beyond we can possibly imagine at the moment. And we've yet to really understand how those impacts are impacting the most vulnerable. But beyond that, we need to really collaborate further on how to prepare ourselves and each other to respond quickly and effectively as and when new climate related shocks, cyclones, floods, droughts, the list goes on, occur. We all have a role to play. And I invite everybody across this session today to really be vocal. I'd really like to encourage all who are around this virtual round table to be bold, to be brave, and not to be shy of challenging the systems and to offer new ideas and new solutions. That's why we're here. So I think with that, I look forward to a really lively and constructive discussion. I will be jumping up and down, chomping at the bit, wanting to hear new things. I want to be challenged by anybody out there. So thank you. Thank you all for doing your bit. Great. Thank you so very much, uh, Tom. I think bold and brave. Very good advice for all our um, you know, specialists, experts, uh, special guests who are over here. And uh, I just want to, before we, uh, before I hand it over to my co-moderators, Professor Menon and Santosh, I also want to say that Kansa is the other partner and they will help us to wrap up the session and speak at the end so that we have a way forward as well. Um, and at that time, I would invite them to do that, right? Um, to really kind of uh, get it going, as I said before we go, I just want to kind of lay out the format of the round table so that it helps us to structure our conversation. And <clears throat> I'm sorry, and the heart of how it, it should be uh, moving ahead. Um, you know, as I said, because it's no panels and presentation, how do you really make this conversation ensure it's as organic as it gets, but it is as structured also so that we really do have the outcomes you look at. And this is the three, three C's as we call it, the, the challenges, the capabilities, and the collaboration. Tom mentioned it in his uh, in his opening address, and, and thank you, Tom, for, for referring to that, because that's really how critical it is for us to keep that in mind when we are talking, so that you, know, you are clear what is it that you really are best suited to talk, because we like to give everybody an opportunity, but when you get that opportunity, we want to make sure you're saying the best thing that you can contribute to this table, because that's what, how we could potentially explore new ideas, new solutions, new perspectives. So please keep that in mind, um, challenges, capabilities, and then of course, um, collaboration. And this can be an iterative process. There's no you know, watertight compartments, but, but the more we are speaking to the room, the more we are speaking 
to the conversation, I think we'll just have that depth and the width that will allow us to go with new perspectives. So uh, once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Harold and Tom for setting that context. And over to you, Professor Menon, to start the conversation with our experts and special guests. Thank you. Thank you very much. As uh, Karen said, you know, we will be looking at uh, challenges, capabilities and collaboration. And RICE uh, values are responsible, inclusive, sustainable, and finally, uh, eco-friendly, you know, and these values were actually highlighted in the plenary this morning. Uh, and we find that in the current world, you know, in a changing world with climate resilience and disaster resilience becomes so important. And so we have actually got CANSA, the Climate Action Network in South Asia with more than 300 member organizations across the eight countries in South Asia, uh, joining us as a co-host of this round table. And we find that uh, this is going to be very, very important because they will actually lay down the challenges. The challenges which were actually highlighted during the, the COP26 at Glasgow, uh, you know, we will actually hear more about that from the cancer colleagues. And so I will request uh, Santosh uh, to introduce, uh, you know, Ranga Palawala, uh, you know, from Belize, uh, looking after the Commonwealth uh, concerns in, in climate finance uh, in the government and also corporate sector. And uh, Ramkishan, uh, who is the Deputy Country Director for Mercy Corps in Nepal. Uh, may I request Santosh to take over. Thank you. Thank you, Manan, sir. Um, uh, it, was, it was a great uh, opening session. I agree with you uh, uh, this morning, but we had kind of uh, a very inspiring uh, speeches from uh, various guests. Uh, so I, I think I started really on a, a very good note, and I'm happy to um, have with my uh, colleagues here, uh, Ranga and, and Ramsa, to to join uh, here in the, in this conversation on, on disaster planning. Um, as introduced by uh, Menon sir, uh, Can South Asia is a network of uh, 300 organizations across South Asia in eight countries, mainly involved in the uh, climate advocacy and, uh, and, and building capacity of the uh, civil society organizations to pursue um, climate action uh, at the community level and also to um, really pressurize uh, the governments to work for, uh, for communities in their uh, planning exercises uh, nationally. So when we talk about climate and disaster, um, um, resilience um, in, in the context, uh, um, then we, we know that planning is kind of very important exercise uh, for building resilience. Uh, resilience, as we know, is, is, is kind of building the, those, uh, those capabilities in, in most of the stakeholders uh, to tide over uh, the, the difficult uh, questions posed by climate disasters and, and repeated climate-related climate, uh, uh, climate -related challenges. Um, uh, so if we talk about particularly from the Indian perspective, if I say uh, that we have planning exercises do uh, at national level, uh, these days we do NAS uh, NDCs and, and we have been, uh, uh, India has already devised the national action plan on, on climate change. Uh, so uh, these exercises are kind of uh, uh, well, very customary exercises which, which go on at the, the national level without the involvement of uh, communities at the, at the um, um, uh, at the village level or at, at the bottom level. So resilience exercises also um, need to be from bottom up uh, uh, because it, it's, it starts from, uh, from communities and individual um, resilience. So uh, planning is, is kind of very basic, uh, very uh, elementary um, a requirement uh, for, for resilience building. Um, so, um, uh, having said that, I think uh, when when we were involved uh, in planning exercises at district level, uh, we came to know that the, the the various programs and schemes which uh, the state government and the central government, which uh, uh, devises for the communities, are not actually. Uh, are in sync with each other and they don't reach communities as, as required. Uh, so I think it's it's really important for building resilience for communities, uh, for climate change or climate disaster for that matter. We need to have that kind of synchronization um, at, the, at, the, at the community level. 
Um, uh, so for that, I think we know that resilience is also a, is a kind of transient characteristics. It, it changes over um, uh, communities, it changes over the socioeconomic and environmental characteristics. It's, uh, um, so it's a transient. So uh, resilience needs to be uh, a, a continuous process and, and it goes on uh, changing uh, in every moment. So uh, I think every individual and, and community needs to have uh, those data and uh, information to make that changes happen over a period of time. Uh, so I think we uh, we faced a kind of a lack of such information. It could be from uh, vulnerability related information or risk information, uh, which is really lacking at the community level uh, so that uh, the communities or the farmers, for example, could take uh, um, climate, uh, friendly uh, or uh, climate uh, clever uh, decisions to make their agriculture, um, uh, uh, you know, which is which makes them um, uh, resilient. Yeah, so those kinds of exercises we 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 have faced. Um, uh, I think all levels of government, communities, and uh, even the private sector also need to design the resilience uh, strategies um, um, as per the. Um, uh, uh, the, the information available uh, through them. Uh, so I think uh, I'll stop here. Uh, we have many experienced colleagues who, who have worked in the, in the different sectors in the different level and have uh, in-depth information on that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Santosh, uh, can you also briefly introduce, uh, you know, um, Ram Kishan uh, from Mercicor, Nepal uh, to speak first? Thank you. Uh, yes, I have the uh, privilege of introducing uh, Mr. Ram Kishan, who is working at the Deputy Regional Director um, ASIA at um, uh, Mercy Corps. Uh, previously, he worked with uh, Christian Aid for, for quite some time uh, in Nepal. Um, um, uh, so we have the kind of personal relationship with Can South Asia because uh, uh, we quite work closely uh, with with uh, in at uh, the institutional level, uh, so he has uh, a tremendous experience in uh, humanitarian and development uh, uh, sector, and have uh, worked in various uh, um, continents in Asia and uh, and also in Africa. So he he comes with uh, loads of information, loads of experiences. Uh, over to you, sir. Thanks, Santosh, and thanks, Karen, uh, Professor Menon. Uh, glad to be here. Um, so let me start. So I take your, your offer, Tom, to be bold and brave on, on some of the things that I will say. So let me start by saying it's not no, um, I think we don't really have any doubt that climate change is happening now. I think many people have this notion that it will happen tomorrow, it will happen in 10 years time, 20 years time, and we're looking at 2050 horizon, we're looking at forecast and predictions that says, okay, this will happen in, in this near. But as we speak, we have all those impacts felt by communities that we work with or where we live. So you see droughts, you see cyclone, the intensity, frequency of flood has increased. So it's it's kind of, it would be not really right to say that we'll have to wait for climate change to happen. The biggest uh, challenge, and I think I would like to put it here and probably when we discuss, we can, we can talk about it, is to acknowledge climate change is there. Uh, we see this at the international level. We see this at the national level and also at local level where people will say, oh, this happened this year, so the flood will not happen next year. A cyclone would be okay. We have climate denial uh, globally where people will say, oh, these are like, okay, if things are getting warmer, there are things which are getting cooler. So, and we had a couple of global leaders who talked about and completely disregarded climate science and talk all kinds of things that we know are not really in, in any way helpful. Uh, the other, area which we know is um, the, the science is very clear. And I think that's what we need to really go and understand what science is telling us. So IPCC report uh, has clearly, or the last uh, report has clearly outlined what is going to happen. And I think it may not be very precise of going to the village, town and district level, but it gives you a broad trend at a continent, at a global level, what is going to happen. And I think if you we, if we look at and acknowledge it, we see those things are actually happening in our lifetime. So we see, uh, many of those disasters that we see, we see communities have been displaced because of uh, erosion, the, uh, um, the sea level rise, uh, which 
if you go to some of the coastal area in Orissa in India or in Bangladesh, there are climate uh, refugees, those who have left their villages and their, their islands and move in. Uh, so, so I will not emphasize more on whether climate change is a reality or not, it is. And I think that's what I want to start. Uh, I would like to put challenges at three different levels. And I will start from where I would see is more important is the policy level, or at least the government level challenges that we see. So most often we see um, the government either will deny the climate change is a cause for a particular event, because it may not be possible to relate every single event with climate change. So one flood, you will not say it has been with climate change, but that's a trend that you have to acknowledge. So one is that lack of acknowledgement that these trends will continue, and this should not be seen as isolated events. And therefore, a comprehensive policy is required to deal with climate change, not piecemeal dealing with one sector like agriculture or housing separately or infrastructure separately or livelihood. It has to be seen in a much more broader sense. Uh, and that will only happen if you acknowledge this is going to continue and not really be isolated events uh, here and there. Uh, the resources which have been allocated by different governments at, at their own capacity are not really sufficient to deal with the future losses that we are looking at. Uh, we are only dealing with maybe the bare minimum. And in most cases, we are looking at insurance as a means of meeting the, the or meeting or at least making communities resilient, which may or may not be the, the only options available. Uh, even going beyond insurance and looking at social protection uh, scheme, which where the state has to play a much more proactive role than just be looking at markets to play out and help communities uh, which are in, in disaster uh, prone areas or uh, impacted by climate change. So that's one area that I would say there is a challenge at the, at the government level, I would say national, uh, sub-national or regional level where there are not enough resources being made available or the policies are not integrated. They're all in, in piecemeal and at different level. The second one I would say is a big gap that we understand between what science says and what people will understand. We have, such a good scientific understanding and knowledge of what climate trends are going to be and what needs to be done. But who's going to take that lab information to the field? So we see a gap between what scientists are um, researching, finding out, and not really taking it. So you, do, you might do a good research paper on impact of climate change in an area. If the local community doesn't understand and doesn't get to know about it, how are they going to be prepared? So we need to really be um, kind of challenging ourselves to take that lab information to the field. And I think I heard it uh, many years back that we need to really bring labs to the field or field to the lab so that there is a connect. And, and the scientific community need to really go down to the community level and make it simpler so that communities can understand. Because if you go to community, they will say, yes, something is changing. Things are not same. The rain is not same, the, the temperature has changed, but how is this going to have, have a long-term impact? That's where the science comes in and, and decoding uh, the scientific knowledge into a local community is important. And that's not happening, I would say, not at a scale uh, where you might have a few pilots here and there, but we don't really challenge our scientific community enough to really come forward and make it much more understandable, where people can understand translated information uh, that is coming from, from uh, the science. And third, and I, I would say that's something which um, I was a very strong believer that communities has all the answers for the changes that they have faced with. Uh, probably I think I'm, I'm challenged myself on this because we put so much of emphasis and so much of pressure on community to say, you know the answers without understanding that the changes are much faster. We know that changes are much faster and at a level that community are not really in a position to cope. Uh, so to say that, oh, you should prepare for future because you know your context better. They know their present, they know their future past, probably they don't know the future. And that's where I think we need to really change the narrative and be a partner with communities and not just put the burden on saying, you solve your problem. So that's where the lab information reaching the community by all of us is, is an important uh, intervention that we can all work on and not really overburden communities with uh, kind of trying to find their and, and have their own quest. Uh, the last thing which is important is also to acknowledge that uh, there, is a, there is a level uh, or, and limit of adaptation that communities will be able to uh, match with. So there are disasters that community will be resilient, but there will be a point where they will have to move. And I think we need to be acknowledging the loss and damage, which is currently being not really mainstream in the climate change and disaster scenario. We need to understand there will be a point, then the river or the sea level rise will not make 
it happened for people to live in those coastal areas or in river line areas or in areas which are going to be flooded frequently and land will be lost. So those should also be part of our planning and that to be part of our futurist planning. So I'll stop here and I'm, I'm sure I've put a couple of challenges and I don't know whether I was enough bold, but yeah, these are some of the things I've put forward and I have Ranga who will add more to it. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Ramsur, for, for taking us through the, the diverse challenges which we face at, at a different level from community at, uh, and also at the policy level. Uh, very important uh, challenges that we, we uh, need to uh, overcome if we, if we would like to address uh, uh, resilience. Uh, now I have the privilege to introduce um, um, uh, Mr. Ranga uh, Palawala, uh, who is the National Climate Finance Advisor uh, at the Commonwealth Secretariat, and uh, um, uh, he has been uh, in in this field of climate finance and and uh, uh, climate planning, etc., uh, for quite a long time. He had worked with Janat um, uh, uh, Action and and other uh, organizations for quite some time, and and he. Um, he, he comes up with uh, a lot of uh, um, um, information, a lot of uh, experience on uh, climate finance um, at a different level. Uh, so over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Santosh, for the introduction. And thank you very much, Professor Vinod, Karen, everybody, uh, for the invitation. It's a privilege for, for being among the, uh, the, the speakers in this particular session. Um, uh, when, when I'm... Uh, Bringing out the challenges of resilience, I think uh, certain things that I'm going to say is, is of course, mentioned by uh, the previous speakers, Ram, uh, Santosh, and even Tom uh, brought out some of the, uh, the points that I, I want to highlight. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges is everybody is talking about resilience building. Do we know what is resilience? That's, uh, I think, the biggest challenge. We have, I, I think, uh, the, most of the people do have an understanding. Uh, I think even even myself, we, we I, I do have an understanding, but I think we know a bit of it. I think the connecting dots are quite important among among all the stakeholders. Uh, the bringing this knowledge around and get a holistic understanding on of resilience. And uh, the, uh, another challenge is when we are talking about resilience building. Of course, it's not just a, a, a social phenomena or an environmental phenomena or an economic phenomenon, it, it cut across all three sectors. It should be, uh, there should be some sort of a social aspects into it. There are economic aspects into it and there are environmental aspects into it. And if you don't have this integration, uh, what we are, we, are, we are bringing out is an unbalanced or unsustainable resilience. So it's like if the resilience is a kind of a, uh, a three-legged stool, if you are strengthening one, one leg means we are we are not strengthening the entire entire stool stability. So this is quite important aspect, I, I think. But when you bringing the entire challenges in a kind of a package, uh, I would I would like to package it kind of a four uh, critical areas of, of things. I think certain things are mentioned. Number one is information. It was mentioned by by Ram as well as Santosh. Uh, the information can come as the scientific knowledge. Uh, uh, indigenous knowledge at the local level, um, uh, and uh, you know, experience the tacit knowledge, etc. But what we see is that the information sharing among the stakeholders, whether it's upstream or downstream, it's it's really poor, and uh, we we need to have kind of an open governance for information sharing. So the information, of course, it's very crucial for decision making. So resilience is something that is. Uh, the crucial timely decision making is quite important. Um, so this is a this is a challenge, and, a, and another challenge within the information is that uh, sometimes we we do have information, but we have not packaged it, catering to different stakeholders. The language is it's not the the literal language, but the uh, the, the real meaning is doesn't understand by by people. For example, I have seen. Uh, some of the uh, the writings or, or, or advocacy messages of the civil society organization is hardly comprehended by the private sector. And sometimes the private sector, uh, the messages are hardly com comprehended by the civil society and the government. So what we need to 
make sure is that the information are shared and we need to make sure that it is packaged that is comprehended by all the stakeholders. Without comprehension, just sharing information might not, not be helpful. So this is quite important. And uh, the resilience, as uh, Santosh and Ram correctly mentioned, it's a, it's a dynamic concept. It changes all the time. And uh, Ram mentioned that the changes with the climate change is far beyond in par with the, the knowledge and the capacities of the communities. You can't ask communities to uh, use their own knowledge to adapt to it. So it's a, it's a transformation process. So the transformation is quite important and we need to understand in this transformation, one of the key uh, the challenge is the institution. Institutions are, are there to make decisions, basically for the governance purposes, for production purposes, et cetera. And uh, the, 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 most of the institutions we have, be at the national level or be it at the local level, have been established to the business as usual pathways. And we have hardly seen that the transformation we required these institutions have happened. And the coordination we required, the integration we required, be it horizontally, be it vertically, is quite lacking. So how we make sure that our institutional systems are transformed in par with the level of challenges we have as far as the climate change resilience is concerned. So uh, it's not just simple capacity building will work. It doesn't uh, bring about just uh, giving some trainings or bringing new institutional structures into it. But this transformation need to happen in all aspects of it. And uh, what I see, one of the biggest challenge we have is we are trying to solve a problem which is new using an old institutional structure which is not compatible with the level of challenges we have. And that creates a lot of problems. It, even with the civil society organizations, when you try to go and dealing with the, with the communities, we have seen this. We are, we're trying to use the more of like very old fashioned, very conventional approach of institutional building. But I think we need to come across, you know, come with a very bold, uh, very innovative type of a transformative info institutional structures at all levels and make sure that all these institutional structures are collaborating horizontally and vertically. Without that, we might not be able to solve it because the climate is changing at a very rapid level. So, uh, so what we need to do is that the process of resilience is, should be so dynamic. So our decision-making process also need to be so dynamic. So our institutions need to be uh, very innovative and very flexible enough to adapt to this dynamic situation so you can make dynamic decisions. But unfortunately, we know in our part of the world, mainly the institutional structures are not dynamic and we have been, you know, uh, in, in the process of very rigid uh, uh, one-way decision-making process. So that's, that's, that's a challenge. And uh, the other component, I said four, I have touched upon in information and the institutions. The other one is the plans and strategies. So basically a roadmap. Of course, when it comes to plans and strategies, I think the, the what I mentioned under the institutions also valid. Uh, it, it means that the plans and strategies also need to be dynamic. It should not be very rigid. Probably the 10-year the plans might not work. We need to have very flexible way of uh, to maneuvering through different uh, the challenges that coming into. So the plans and strategies are important. So the institutions and the people are driven by, by that, uh, the, the process, but it's important that we have that dynamism within the, the plans and the strategies. The final part, of course, it's something that, that I, I work on is financing. Uh, we are talking about transformation. We need to move out of from the business as usual pathways. So moving out of business as usual pathways are not easy. You need to do a lot of hard changes at the ground level, which needs a lot of uh, the investments. Because we are living in a world where you have made past investment into uh, looking at a different projection. So now you need to change that direction. And of course, to make that dent, you need a lot of money need to be pumped in at different levels, at different institution level, at the different level of whether it's national or community level or regional level. 
So these in investments are quite important. So we need to, the, the challenge is that how we mobilize that money, how we make sure that we utilize the existing financial so resources to the right uh, the place. Uh, we have seen some of the, the, the finances have been used, but of course there are a lot of doubts whether we have really invested in the, in the right place. So I think the challenges can be packaged into information, the institutions, uh, the plans and strategies, and finances. So I'll stop there. Probably during the discussion, we can talk more. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, fascinating that uh, um, old institutions can't really um, challenge um, <clears throat> and, and resolve the new issues which, which we are uh, facing right now. Um, forget about climate change and, and uh, a very complex uh, uh, developmental issues such as climate change. Um, um, Professor Menon, uh, if we take uh, here from, from here. Yeah. Santosh and uh, Professor Menon, if I may just jump in for just a second, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, two, three reminders over here. One is we're already done with almost one hour of our time. I, I can't believe it. People tell me that, uh, you know, in the webinar world, people don't stay more than an hour. We haven't lost a single person. We've in fact added some. So obviously the conversation is flowing, but we also only have one hour left. So I would really want to, to make sure that we use it to its maximum and keep it moving. Uh, also want to remind everybody that uh, the chat box is live and moving over there as well. And parallel, this is where you leverage what you have. If it is a con, you convert it into a pro. And so the chat box is buzzing with questions. Uh, there has been one question in the Q&A and I would request someone to respond to that. It would be lovely to have uh, the expert views on that as well. And of course, um, in the chat box, we have questions and, and comments coming in over there as well. So please feel free to interact at multiple levels in, the, in this round table, because uh, we're going to use everything we have to make sure we move ahead. Yeah. Thank you so much. And Professor Menon, over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, after listening to the climate resilience concerns, the challenges before us, uh, we will move to looking at disaster resilience and look at the capabilities of uh, multi-stakeholders, you know, stakeholders in, uh, in the government, in, in, in the corporate sector, in the civil society sector. And so we will discuss it across, uh, you know, the experiences of institutions and uh, academic institutions, academia, practitioners, civil society uh, in different regions. So we have uh, Dr. Roman Fandlage from South Africa, from the Rhodes University, who is the regional director of uh, teams for Asia, uh, for Africa, who will speak on the challenges, uh, the capabilities uh, of uh, disaster resilience in Africa. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Roman Pandlich to kindly initiate his uh, brief intervention for about five to seven minutes. Thank you. Roman? He's not on the panel. Yeah, he was definitely there. Okay. Okay. Can we perhaps move on? And if I might just request, I know this is really hard task to do, but if I could request that, uh, you know, all our speakers kind of stay within three to five minutes at the maximum, because we really want to get everybody's voices in here. So I'm sorry, I have the hard task to do this, but uh, well, someone's got to do it. So thank right. you. Right. Hello, I'm here now. Okay. Um, yeah, please carry on. Yes, I apologize for the late arrival. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk to you a little bit about um, some of the activities that um, Teams does on the African continent and also talk a little bit about resilience, um, how we see it. Um, um, the previous speakers, um, I agree with a lot what has been um, said already. The major, um, I think, change that we've got um, on the African continent is the um, historical um, leftovers, should we say, from the previous political arrangements such as colonialism and um, uneven distribution of resources, which is quite common across the continent. Um, this has um, remained a highly debated political issue, uh, which drives quite a lot of strife, um, specifically 
pretty much around the continent, but um, specifically from where I'm located, which is the southern African part of the of the African continent. Um, there have been a lot of uh, political unrest recently in areas such as Zimbabwe and um, also quite a lot of um, recent tensions in South Africa about access to economy, historical vulnerabilities. Um, and then uh, what has also um, happened is that the economic disparities are becoming more and more pronounced, especially during COVID-19 when the lockdowns have resulted in limited mobility and increasing, um, increasing the um, uh, impact of the pandemic, not just the direct ones, but also the secondary cascading disaster impacts on the system and on the populations due to limited access to um, financial resources and uh, also limited access to um, healthcare and so on. Um, what is um, very important um, to um, realize um, and state probably is one of the notions that is currently being um, researched quite uh, extensively and that is not just resilience but also just transition. Just transition um, is been um, uh, become a hot topic um, in the context of the Paris Climate Accord and then also um, related negotiations which have followed for COP26. And um, currently, for example, in South Africa, one of the uh, tensions is about the provision of energy for uh, the entire country. Um, last, uh, uh, last couple of years have seen, for example, rolling power cuts across the country something that we have called, uh, we have come to known as load shedding. And one of the reasons for it is that the power generation is insufficient to meet the demands of the industry and the population growth in the country. So um, historically, South Africa has uh, relied heavily on its major resources of coal. And currently due to the climate transition, this has become a very politically controversial topic and subject because of the need to reduce uh, the carbon footprint. Um, in addition, uh, South Africa imports most of its fuel from overseas and the prices and the fluctuations of the local currency are causing a uh, large vulnerability of the population in terms of uh, limited supply of fuel, which then has knock-on effects onto prices of uh, basic foodstuffs and uh, access to water and so on. Now, in the context of this, large offshore drilling is planned for shale gas and related sources of um, mostly natural gas off the coast of South Africa, which could potentially have an impact on the livelihood of communities that rely on tourism and are living in the coastal areas of the country. Which is why the tension is now between people that uh, realize a need to drive the provision of new energy and the population and the potential impacts on the environment this might have. And the discussions are quite um, fiery but they bring to the point of one important element and that is the complexity of the transition that the uh, developing world and South Africa being more on the developed side of the developing world and that uh, how will the just transition actually take place? Now, at the same time, uh, tra just transition and resilience do have local, um, do have local elements. In the context of the African continent, um, there is generally at least two or sometimes three disasters as we know them under the current or classical, should we say, definitions going on. COVID might be one, but at the same time, for example, in Southern Africa, we've had El Nino caused drought and it's knock on uh, cousins taking place since 2015. So in the context of COVID, when um, still to this day, personal hygiene and uh, washing hands and uh, focusing on maintenance of hygiene is one of the main uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions to contain the pandemic, uh, drought indicates that this could be a problem. At the same time, uh, lockdowns have caused lack of access to people who are on antiretroviral medications where two pandemics of COVID-19 and HIV have collided. Now, long-term effects of conditions like these are only going to manifest with time, 
and it, that's in the context of the developing world. And I believe in the wider context, which is where I think activities of teams are so critical due to the fact that it pulls the expertise in from 17 chapters it has across the world, is understanding the resilience as a fluid term and as a fluid notion uh, in the context of a complex reality that has been accentuated and made uh, laid bare by COVID, but also cascading effects of multiple disasters, which are only becoming known to um, uh, humanity one at a time but which need to be dealt with comprehensively together. Um, in the context of the African activities of um, teams, we have tried to contribute to this by conducting research on water and sanitation for the past decade in, and their links to disaster management, developing uh, indicators and uh, trying to gain local understanding, local and regional understanding of resilience in the context of knock-on effects of water sanitation and access to it in terms of public health and other types of disasters. And we try to integrate this knowledge. Yeah. Thank you. We try to integrate this knowledge with uh, activities on civil protection and related projects that Teams is related to, uh, is involved in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roman. You know, you have given a wide range of uh, concerns in terms of the capabilities of institutions. Uh, I feel that now, you know, we need to also look at uh, the Asian context. And I would request uh, Mr. Meen Chetri, uh, you know, from Nepal, from Kathmandu, to kindly share his thoughts on disaster resilience. He has worked extensively on disaster risk reduction in the government of Nepal. May I request uh, Mr. Meen Chetri to initiate his uh, intervention. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Good afternoon again. Uh, thank you, Professor Menon, for giving me this uh, chance. Uh, how long do I have time? About three to five minutes. OK. <clears throat> OK, thank you. Um, uh, I, I, I will focus on Nepal, uh, basically. Why is Nepal most vulnerable to climate change? Uh, it is due to that Nepal is particularly vulnerable to climate change related natural disasters, uh, <coughs> which is why the government of Nepal has formulated and endorsed several climate change plans, policies and strategies. Uh, however, implementation part has remained a problem, always a problem with us. And millions of Nepalese are estimated to be at risk from the impacts of climate change, including reductions in agricultural production, food security, uh, strained water resources, loss of forests, and bi biodiversity, as well as damage uh, infrastructure. And <clears throat> if we talk about uh, political aspect of climate change in Nepal, you see, uh, the government of Nepal has envisioned climate justice in its climate change uh, policy. In 2011, we had uh, this uh, climate change policy. Um, this was a very good policy indeed, but um, actually, again, the implementation part has been uh, remained a, pro a problem always with us. <clears throat> um, my internet is un unstable, so I will just stop my uh, video for the moment. And climate change, uh, actually, <clears throat> as we all know, is a complex problem, uh, not only in Nepal, beyond Nepal as well and raises more questions than provides answers. And uncertainty is high, and models do not tell us specifically what is likely to happen. Uh, therefore, un uncertainty about what the impact will be does not mean what we should do, nothing. And people will be more vulnerable, and they need for adaptation. Uh, their need for adaptation is a, a crucial matter. And uh, <clears throat> The government uh, has not so far been able. Uh, what are the possibilities for adaptation? That that is the main main thing. And uh, another thing is who decides how to adapt and how is that decision made? And how are the perspectives of the affected and those who are already making autonomous decisions included? And what can the government do in terms of plant adaptation? So the, these are the major questions. And answers are not easy, because every group in every community uh, right across Nepal has its own set of vulnerabilities. You see, Nepal being a small country, it has, it has a diverse, uh, diversified geography. So it is uh, difficult to cope. 
And in addition, since vulnerability is uh, dynamics, those shares of vulnerabilities will alter as climate change begins to impact the interlinkages among livelihood systems in Nepal. And uh, besides water management, disaster risk reduction, agriculture and forestry and financial instruments, all these things are being in impacted. And actually on climate change, adaptation action plan advances climate resilient communities, ecosystems and economies, which particular focus on vulnerable populations. The poor women, indigenous people, all, all these. And on climate change finance perspective, the green, yeah. Uh, Mr. Meen Chetri, actually, I think, uh, you know, you have raised many sets of issues concerning this. And I think the challenge for all of us across the world is essentially uh, how we will be able to address the problems of uh, resilience building among all these stakeholder groups. So we mm -hmm. have also, uh, you know, the challenges before us in terms of uh, the lack of uh, information, which is actually pointed by many people. You know, we really do not have the information. We do not have baselines. We do not really understand what are the critical multi-hazard risks and vulnerability and exposure profiles which people are facing. So I think, you know, we will need to listen to the aspects on collaboration. Uh, so I request uh, Sarabjit to kindly take over and, uh, uh, you know, address the the concerns, the, chal the challenges and capabilities and collaboration, because, you know, we really need uh, solutions to the kind of concerns which are raised. Uh, over to you, Sarabjit. Uh, excuse me, Madam Sir, uh, Dr. Atik Rahman uh, uh, is here from Bangladesh. I think he would be uh, a very good uh, resource person to speak about the, the planning exercises for the, the mill resilience planning. So if it's, it's possible uh, to bring in some time, uh, Dr. Atik Rahman. Yes, uh, you know, we would request Dr. Atik Rahman to be the first speaker when we have the open house, okay, after UNICEF uh, completes the capabilities part, collaboration part. Is it okay? Thank you. Request. Thank you, Vinod. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, go ahead, uh, Sanatji. We can hear you. Um, so, uh, I will just voice uh, the concerns of our youth and offer you some some sort of opportunities on what we can do with, with youth. Uh, we're really upset that we've been brought to the last decade of action. And we have, though we have known for decades that we need to act, but we haven't. And this internationally brokered uh, uh, climate action and sustainability development is hardly working. It's not producing any results. As a consequence, what was challenge, sustainability challenge few decades ago has now become a local resilience crisis. Yeah? So, so from a from a challenge to we've been brought to a crisis. Yeah? Um, and while we were debating and uh, all over the world, our important convergence happened between rapid organization of the globe and climate change. And that has created another big sort of uh, uh, challenge for, or rather a existentialist challenge for, for us, uh, that uh, post-carbon cities has become a huge uh, uh, design challenge, planning challenge, a cultural and behavioral challenge. When will we do it? We do not have time. We don't have the luxury of time. So I'm gonna put forward three attitudinal capabilities I'll call upon your attitudinal capabilities. You all have it uh, to address the cost of inaction of past decades at scale. Hmm? So first of all, put all the debates to rest. I guess we all have that capability to put all the debates to rest and act across all scales. Hmm? Um, as we don't have the luxury of time huh, in this decade of action. Number two, we need inspired action versus we being scared to action. No, So we, we got to work with an outcome orientation. Outcome orientation means we got to enjoy the work. We got to uh, celebrate the results and, uh, and value the relationships which we build uh, across uh, a range of factors. 
may I say the question is not really whether or not you or I go on, but rather how are we going to enjoy it? And I think the the whole um, climate discourse is full of gloom, and I think we got to shift that. Number three, courage to collaborate. Tom spoke about it, and I think I let me voice it again. Courage to collaborate without any prejudice. With so leave no one behind in partnerships, including at-risk communities, children, women, men, uh, the the, the so-called global leaders and politicians and whatnot. Hence, I would suggest that use culture theory uh, to build at least those four types of partnerships. Leave no one behind in your partnerships. Now offering certain things from us from our side from unicef unicef has has a robust uh, program with uh, with uh, youth uh, across uh, different uh, paradigms uh, we have launched and over the last two years uh, an organization by the name of yuva so you can go to yuva.org and and this is where through through Yuva we are harvesting the the capabilities of uh, our youth population across the world. We we have uh, a lot of energy, a lot of commitment from youth, and uh, that's happening. So so we've launched a, a climate warriors program through which number of youth can start engaging. Uh, Last year, we ran Green Job series, uh, a sort of a month long uh, engagement process of uh, learners as well as teachers. Uh, so bringing them together uh, so that youth of today can contribute to making the resilient future. So, so how, how do you pick up green jobs? What are the green jobs? Look out for the for the next one this year. Uh, between April and May, uh, follow us on, on our social media. Uh, we're going to run another round of uh, this engagement of uh, youth for green jobs. Um, another very pertinent one, and, and I think this time I, I would like to bring it a little more local in Maharashtra. Uh, with government of Maharashtra has been doing some really trailblazing uh, work. Uh, they, they've been... Uh, They've launched this Machi Vasundra platform uh, through which the, the uh, youth parliamentarians of uh, uh, UNICEF is working with the youth parliamentarians at, at district level. And they will be able to engage with mainstream platforms for policymaking, not the separate platforms. So youth participating uh, at, uh, at scale uh, in the real, uh, real world. Huh? Uh, and government of Maharashtra has launched uh, with a UNICEF support uh, curriculum uh, for all schools uh, on environmental sustainability. So that is a huge piece in which teachers are being trained and curricula and extracurricular activities are being trans transactioned across communities, schools and beyond. Uh, any any organization which want to pick it up and replicate it in other states other countries most welcome yeah. so unicef and indian institute of technology in uh, gandhinagar has uh, launched a, a very innovative uh, online portal uh, that harvests data and information from 26 satellites uh, which provides minute by minute prediction of the emerging climate uh, maybe in the form of drought, maybe in the form of floods. So that's available, but it goes beyond to, I'll just take half a minute more. It goes beyond to, to provide sectoral advisories to, uh, to all the sectors on how do they need to adapt and act in the coming short term, short, medium and long term. So any organization that wants to collaborate with UNICEF on getting these advisories contextual to the to the given context in india or any other country are most welcome to join us in the end our offers are only as good as our ability to support your aspirations i i speak to the youth 
we at UNSF will continue to solicit uh, feedback from youth groups and leaders and ensure that we are always listening and adapting along with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarabjit. I think uh, we really need to change gears and also change voices. Uh, and I think here would be a great time to bring in, since you spoke about you are, which you, which obviously is a huge, uh, you know, I think platform for the youth to get a voice and do something. And we actually have with us one of such youth who has been uh, doing some phenomenal work and raising a voice at, you know, all kinds of platforms, including COP26. And so I'm going to ask uh, Hita, is she here? I hope so. Yeah, uh, I'm here. <laughs> Great. Hi, Hita. So I'm going to ask you to very quickly come in and, uh, you know, add to the conversation and, of course, raise a few, um, few notches higher, the whole temperature so that we start moving ahead. Go ahead, please. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with all of you. And uh, I think the past hour or hour and a half almost has been uh, very interesting, also very uh, you know, enlightening on different aspects of what we can do, the role of, you know, the different kinds of roles that we play in fighting the climate crisis. And while we do talk about, um, you know, young people, how we're going to be affected by the future, but, you know, it's our future that's at stake when we talk about the climate crisis. Um, I think there's one element that we need, to, we need to realize is where, of course, yes, um, we are, so to say the victims of the climate crisis, but at the other side, we also come with solutions. So we not just come with passion and energy, uh, but we come with expertise in different levels uh, at different fields. For talking about myself, my story began when I did my master's in, uh, I mean, it began when I was much younger actually, when I was the age of 12 or 13, uh, but then eventually decided to do a master's in environmental studies. And after that, uh, when I, got the chance. I was working, of course, very unrelated right after my master's. I was working as a German language translator. So I had nothing to do with the academic background that I had. Um, but when I got the chance to go to COP21 in Paris, and after that, you know, as I stayed engaged, joined youth groups, uh, started volunteering, um, and eventually quit my job and got full time into the field of environment. The biggest, you know, uh, lesson that kept coming back to me, or the biggest uh, impact that I had was one, about how despite having been to international spaces, how despite having the educational background needed, um, there was still a huge knowledge gap, especially of the international processes, the policies, the way that the, you know, the UN functions, the way that these uh, decisions are being made internationally, all of that I had to teach myself from scratch. And I think this kept coming back saying that, you know, when we look at a country like India, especially, and this was back in about 2016-ish when uh, the youth movement was active, but not as active as you see it today, um, in, especially in India, but even in other parts of the world. Um, there is a disconnect, especially when you talk about so many Indian young people who are growing up to be facing the impacts of the climate crisis, but having no idea of what is coming their way. And there was a huge educational gap. So no matter how much the formal education does, I think there was still some amount of educational gap that I felt was needed to be bridged. And which is why I think a couple of years later, I got into climate change education and now building up uh, a little bit on that. So working on two streams, but anyway, I mean, the point is that we need to empower young people or at least we need to equip them with the knowledge. I think the empowerment comes as is, but as long as you can give them the knowledge and the experience of what it's really it is, um, the facts as is without Number one, without you know either painting it either side, the facts in itself are paint a very dreary picture. But um, the idea that we always need to end something, that we always have to have a positive note to something, I think we do have to realize that people have, especially young people today, have realized that we are in a situation where if we only, if if we don't act up and we only keep talking about what's going to happen and we only talk about what kind of actions we can take at some point in the future. Um, I think that little level of hope which we have is going to completely go away. So looking at the, you know, we still have time. Yes, time is ticking and, you know, we're running out of time, all of that. But we still have time if we start today. 
And uh, if we really move on with all the technology that we have, with all the knowledge that we have, with all the expertise that we have, you know, with such, especially in this room, such wonderful people with different kinds of backgrounds, doing everything that they can in, in their area of expertise, right? Um, this is precisely what we need. And I think what we also need is really a lot more of systemic change. No matter how much we talk about, you know, change at the individual level, change at the community level, what we do need is a drastic systemic change. The way that our current systems, the way that our current economic models or the developmental models are working are not going to take us to a future that we want. And if we do not rethink this, if we do not rethink on how are we going to address the very simple problems like capitalism, the very simple problems like consumerism, where there is a constant created need, a created demand, whether it is for products, whether it is for something else, no matter what it is, there is an artificial demand and, and then of course a supply created for that. And then we fall into the whole jargon of, or we fall into the net of what we call is this you know, cycle. And we're in an economic system where we cannot break out of this. And I think this in itself is a problem. Um, we really need to think about the environment, not as an externality, but really as a part of the system, not as something that will be affected by our actions, but our actions are dependent on the environment. We cannot eat without food. Food comes from the soil. We need good water. So it's very simple. Uh, you know, we, we really need to think about this as a holistic uh, situation. And when I say it's very simple, it's not, it's not necessarily very simple to put it into action. I'm not living in an idealistic scenario. I do understand the complexities and I, I also engage at different kinds of levels at the United Nations to at the local level on the ground with school children. So when you talk about the range of uh, you know, difficulties, yes, it is not easy to make this change. Yes, it is not easy to transition to an ideal world that we would want to see. Um, but I think better difficult than dead. So we'd rather start today um, and you know, face the difficulties, face the challenges, than in the next 15 years, 20 years, 50 years, whatever that might look like, have a planet which is not sustainable for human life in itself. So, I mean, long story short, when we do talk about all of this, we have to realize that, and I think one of the panelists before mentioned that adaptation is, cannot be the only solution. We cannot adapt to an ever-changing climate. We cannot adapt to a planet which is going to be four degrees warmer. So we do have to think about different ways on how we're tackling this, looking really at the root cause. And mitigation has to go hand in hand with adaptation. Of course, even while we adapt, even while we mitigate, we're at a point where we will have to already try and take care of the impact. So loss and damage is a huge part of everything that we, that we do need. So really looking at that and seeing how we can work together through an intergenerational lens, taking everyone on board is the one thing that I would like to uh, leave us with. Great. Thank you so very much, Ita. I think an intergenerational lens is just so critical, not just for the future, or not just for the current generation, but also for future generations. And we really do need to keep that in mind. Uh, I'm going to quickly ask, uh, you know, Loy to uh, come in over here. Uh, Loy is uh, a mass practitioner from the Mass Practitioner Network and has also worked in Myanmar and lives in Egypt and right now in India. So I'm not too sure exactly where he is right now, but uh, Loy, over to you very quickly please yeah and i do want to remind everybody we have only half an hour so we do want to get in more voices so as quick as possible and yes use the chat box because the more we, use it, the more we get to make sure that we have a lot more to take away from here so Lloyd, over to you real quick yeah i i think i'll come directly to solutions and to action that we need to take we need greater collaboration between the communities who are focusing on disasters and those who are focusing on climate change. We need local action. Advocacy is not enough. We do more advocacy and less action. So we need to shift the focus away. And we need to share the difficulties that we have in making changes when we take action. So then we will get more realistic we will identify the partnerships that are needed and we will bring in other sectors who need to collaborate with us. 
So I would suggest that we be a bit, bit more nuanced and uh, realistic in the way we collaborate, in the partners we identify and bring together and uh, accept the challenges that we all face. I am happy to talk further. We need to work at multiple levels. We need to work in multiple sectors. And we need to work locally, recognizing the differences. So I think I would encourage us to link up, to build partnerships and work together, even if we disagree. And we must do that. And that will bring about a difference. So I think that's all I want to say. I'm happy to have any challenges or questions asked to me, but that's what I want to say for the moment. I have a lot more to say, of course, but I'm really uh, happy like, to. Yeah, I really like now. your statement, Lloyd, that even if we disagree, and I think that's so important, right? Because solutions come out of diverse opinions as well as uh, different lenses and perspectives. So right. I think it's really important what you brought up that, you know, even if we disagree, I think we need to agree to disagree and find out why we disagree and then accordingly work on solutions together. So thank you for bringing up that very, very important uh, point. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, Santosh, you had mentioned Atik. Will Atik be able to join us and say a few words at this point? Or how would you, uh, how would you like to go ahead? Professor? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's there, yes. I would like to uh, be if he could hear me, uh, Dr. Atik Rahman, please come in. Uh, I will try to message him. Uh, I think in the meantime, we could go ahead, uh, Menon, sir, if you. Yeah. Well, Dr. Atik, if he's already there, then you know, we can request him to uh, yeah, share his he can thoughts. See. He can speak. Uh, I've been trying to move him as a panelist, but it's not happening. But he can definitely speak. Is he there? Mm -hmm. Dr. Atik, can you speak? Not sure what's the problem. He's, he's there as an attendee, uh, not in the panelist. Yeah, we've been trying to move him uh, to the panelist, but it's not happening. He, I mean, he's not accepting it. So I'm not too sure what is the problem from his. Yeah, end. so we move, we move forward. Yeah. Yeah, please. Let's, let's move okay. Uh, then, um, you know, we have uh, many other pe distinguished people in the in the room. So those of you who would like to speak, can you please uh, you know, share a message in the chat box so that then we can request you to speak. We will open it up for the discussions for the next uh, 15 minutes, 20 yeah. minutes. Yeah. But I think minutes, uh, Shannon has been posting quite a bit in the chat box. May I request if Shannon can come in really quickly? And then uh, even uh, uh, Mr. Ayer, if he could also come in after that, would that be all right? Very quickly, yeah. Shannon, why don't you go ahead? And Karen, I was chatting, so you didn't ask me to speak. <laughs> so, but I thought this was fantastic. And I actually really appreciated as the conversation proceeded, um, how we got to some really concrete, uh, you know, tangible things that we could actually practice. Um, I think the only thing I would possibly add, because these are people who know way more about these topics than I do, um, is that I really think we need to practice the art of listening a lot more. It's something that uh, that we really train a lot with our network. And I just like to offer it as another possible um, contribution to the to the package that that it's it's not just getting people together, but also working hard to to train them how to listen to each other, because I think this is a key missing component to a lot of our collaborations right now. That's all I will add. And thank you very much, everyone. It was fantastic. I've loved this. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Uh, I think also I would like to ask uh, Colonel Roy, uh, if I might ask. Yeah, sorry, Professor Menon, go ahead. Ah, I think he's here. Very yeah. nice. Very nice. I'm so glad. Go ahead, I think, please. Colonel Dave, we'll bring you next. Yeah? <laughs> sure. I think he's, I think he's a guest. <laughs> I think. Can you hear me? This is Atik here. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh, good, good. Let me just make a short three-minute uh, intervention. You. Thank quickly. you so much. Thank uh, you. First of all, we have a, we meaning the global community at different levels, different components, and different expertise, and grounded in different geography, 
history and uh, continent. Uh, we have a complex uh, development over the last 40 years in the whole question of sustainability, sustainable development, and disaster management. And this has moved quite dramatically into solutions for communities, solutions for ecosystems, and solutions for the future. What is that is the most important part, is looking forward to the future, just not as a challenge. We must understand the depth of the challenge and the intensity. At the same time, we must not be frightened by that. We must look into future solutions. And the solutions lie with the communities, with the people in multiple ways. And we must be able to use this diversity of approach uh, and the resilience that the different system brings in, whether it's geography, whether it's ecology, whether it's uh, economics or the social systems. But as a whole, the point that was made of integration is very, very vital. And at the same time, we have to be learning to cooperate and listen, but at the same time, share the experience. A lot of experience lies at the community level, at the people's level, and that has to be brought in because those they are not the fortunate enough to be in this link. We are the connectors, those who are into this link. So our job is to bring those experiences and make sure that goes across cultures, across societies, across ecosystems, as well as across time, past, present, future. And we have to move for the future as solution to the challenges. The climate challenge is going to magnify. It's not going to reduce easily. So it's going to affect many more people. Unfortunately, is the poverty stricken? It is the people having low quality of health. It is the communities with low quality of water. These are essentially the communities, those are already vulnerable, will become more vulnerable in the future. So the future for is for us to be analyzed, looked at, and any solution we get at one point, must, we must be able to pass it on, replicate, and others to transform into creative uh, uh, forces for both for making progress and accountability and evolving social systems. So I don't want to take too much time now as there are many speakers. I would just say, let's try and be positive about it. This is history, historical evolution of human society face this challenge in different forms, different types, in different places. But now we are much more connected through the internet. We are much more integrated through the geographies and the various disciplines that has emerged out of that. Climate change and disaster management are two very bold, rapidly changing and progressing disciplines. Many actors are coming in, whether from theoretical mathematicians to statistical analysts, to uh, geographers, historians, implementers on the field, to new generation, youth, and the whole lot. So our job is to use this diversity as a strength and not to be frightened by it. Our job is to understand the multiplicity of options and not to be daunted that, oh my God, how are you going to handle this? This is, it is not a choice, choice of handling or defining the future. Future we must face. And with the lucky ones who have been educated, who have been put into the systems are already taking these issues forward. It is our job to make sure those are not fortunate enough are brought into the circle. And we I'm sorry, I think we lost Mr. Atik. Uh, but Mr. Atik, if you can hear me, uh, I think you know you brought up some such very, very critical points that climate change is contextual. Uh, there are many, many layers to it. And also the fact that 
um, as you said, you know, if we are talking about the SDGs and no one left behind, then the vulnerables are the ones that we really need to focus on. And at the same time, even if it is contextual, it is also integrated. So that was a fantastic point to bring up uh, and make us think again in terms of whatever we are working on and doing. Um, as Professor Menon mentioned, I think we will request for Marco. No, Marco Colonel, Thomas, Colonel, Dave, yeah. Colonel Dave and then Marco. Ah, Hi. I'm sorry. Colonel Rohit Dev, yes. <laughs> Please excuse No problem. <laughs> Dynamic situation. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Not at all. Not at all, Karan. I can understand. So, yeah. Karan, firstly, thank you to you and Rise to get me on this platform for the first time. And uh, let me tell you, I will take the cue, Karan, from your subject, the last part. And I will just connect the dots for you no know, an understanding. The changing world. And when I say that, I say it with a lot of experience because one has been in, you know, buggers melee with... Uh, all kinds of earthquake and flood, uh, you know, relief management and disaster management. The last one I saw was in Kashmir 2014. And, 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 and I can appreciate from where all the speakers come through to connect at the lowest level and, and the societal level, the government level. But let me tell you, in this changing world, what is changing? The first thing which is changing is the minds. You saw a young, you know, Hita Ji today. You have seen a Greta Thunberg on the UN. And all the youngsters, the next generation which is after us, they are getting more and more aware. And what's it doing to the world? It is bringing the common consensus on an issue like climate change or the resilience development mechanisms for, for a disaster together. So it's not only the Hollywood movies which are making their minds work. It is the future and the reality which is staring at us, which is making these young minds come up today. The second thing which is working very well in terms of the connect is G2G connect and B2B connect and such like connects where the world is shrinking and your problem does not remain your problem, it becomes my problem and our problem. The third way to look at it is, and, and that's the reason why you find the World Bank so active, you find a John Kerry after his you know, deposition as, as a senator today doing a climate envoy. That's the focus and that, that's why we are speaking today. You see technology, AI, it is, it is becoming such a connected world. Today some hurricane happens somewhere in the fast east coast of US or somewhere else. You have it on Twitter in matters of three or four seconds. And that's the way the world is changing. And that is the route, the main route through which all the connectivity and response mechanisms, collective response mechanisms will, will, will come up tomorrow. Collaboration has got three major concerns. The first one is the intent. And intent comes from citizens, societies, nations, and as a whole, when you come as a committee of nations. The second part of collaboration, which is today happening today, is transatlantic, transglobal is for projects and finance. I, I am in a company where we are dealing with finance with you know outside companies and banking systems right from Japan to US. And that's the way it is going to formulate in terms of climate focus. And in all these circles, which I've mentioned, the primary reason which is bringing about a climate kind of a disruption which needs to be arrested is the energy consumption, mining and things we do. And that is where uh, energy transition, so to say, will be the fiber. And to connect the energy transition in a very meaningful way, whether you're today doing fossil fuel, you want to do alternate fuel, biofuel, electric vehicles, whatever your transition is, and finally it may land up with even nuclear. But the transition has to have demand, it has to have finance, and it has to have a lot of no, collaboration and cooperation. And all this which we do, I think six key features which remain, which we have discussed, is sustainable development goals, financial inclusion, how to get the rural economy involved, a circular economy, because at the bottom of the pit, whether you take climate change, response mechanism for disaster management, the rural sector upwards has to rise and be part of the national system or the global system. The fourth point is about the environment. We have to make our own choices, me, you, we collectively. And all that we do should also contribute towards a better environment and health and least but you know last but not the least is energy saving because what we conserve today has got lesser ramifications even for the climate mitigation even for disaster mitigation and all i can say is as citizens global citizens we should strive to be the citizen we want to be be the change you want to see and i am so glad that we had a hita today we will have many more in this conference and i believe you me together or you individually can make the difference. I will only exhort through your platform that when you see a problem, like say disaster management, you all have to be connected. We all have to be connected 
share our inputs, experiences. There has to be a cloud mechanism. Don't try to earn money from your softwares. Get the world closer together for these niche critical issues, climate change, disaster management, energy transition. And these three are all interlinked with us and our future generations. That's my short point. Don't want to elaborate because we have very little time. Someday later, I can put all this into a probably a slide after this and showcase on social media. You can all have a you know, look at it. We can interact on all the points we have talked about. And I've also tried to you know, just mention in the passing right now. Thank Absolutely. you for the platform, Carol. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Colonel Dave. Please believe me that this is not the end of the conversation. I am sure there are going to be many more opportunities for all of us to interact and continue this conversation either offline as a group or individually one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. uh, we definitely believe that you know, the RICE uh, Summit continues in the form of regional forums, sectoral forums. So looking forward to those kind of opportunities, because that is also part of the collaborative process going further, right? Uh, so I'm going to ask next Rutuja to please come in and uh, quickly jump in and, and say a few words, after which we have Marco. Yeah. Um, Mr. Kumar Ayer, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ritsha. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone from across the world. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. My name is Rutuja Kakkar. I am from India, Maharashtra district, Palghar. Uh, Palghar, I would like to state this issue more locally. Palghar district is uh, near coastal area. And uh, Palgar, we have seen a lot of garbage dumped on the roadside beaches, which is not segregated properly, which causes bad smell and stray dogs and cats eat that dumped garbage, which is mostly plastic. And every end of the week, the dumped plastic garbage, which is mostly plastic, electronics, etc., is been burned openly together in the environment, which leads to harmful greenhouse gases, uh, which stays in the environment for a long time, which get traps in the environment. So our foundation, Save the Foundation works for waste management in Palgar district. Our volunteer who are from colleges, we go to housing society, hotels, etc., and explain them about waste management and why it is important. Out of five, two, three people agree with us. So they give us their used plastic to us. Every week, our truck goes around Palghar district and collects all the kind of waste, which includes soft plastic and electronic waste, and give it for recycling. Our foundation has been working on environment from past 10 years, and from last year we have started working on waste management till now we have recycled 10 tons of plastic the road is long ahead but i hope one day we will get there and this was my first session with rise i i uh, i have to say this is not the last i would like to thank you everyone for listening and giving me this opportunity Thank you so much, Rituja. I think I would have really loved it if you had had your video on, but I did not want to stop you in the middle of your of your, of your points because it's so important and it's so great to have this kind of a voice straight from the ground. Uh, I think very quickly, I'm going to ask Marco. I'm very sorry. I know I'm now rushing things up because I'm very conscious of the time. We have only 10 minutes. Of course, if the whole panel is all right, I mean, I'm sorry, look at me, right? This is force of habit. If the entire round table is all right, we can always extend it by maybe 10 minutes maximum. And if most of you are okay, please put in the chat box, yes, 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 yes. And we will get, we will make sure that uh, more people get a chance to talk, right? But right now, over to you, Marco, really quick. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, it won't be long, only two hours. Uh, so what I've been listening to is really in interesting discussion. Let me tell you that uh, I come from a, a different perspective since I represent the industry, the industry that deals with uh, uh, disaster resilience or preparedness uh, on a professional and, and, of course, business case model. And what we've encountered in our past and this doesn't concern, I would say, only our domain that deals with earthquakes, but I would say it deals with all uh, natural disasters, is that the governments are too uh, ignorant about it. Uh, I mean, they look very short term, most of them. Maybe there are 
some uh, exemptions. But what we found out is that nobody is really interested in the long term solutions. Uh, and this is something that needs to be dealt with. Uh, if not so much with what we do, earthquakes are really short term uh, forecasts uh, for us. Uh, that's what we specialized in. But the, the climate change is something that shows in the longer term uh, it's, uh, well, fighting the climate change, change um, shows in the long term uh, effects. And to actually have the support, it's good to start from the grassroots, but you also need to have the political support. Otherwise, it's in vain. It's it's really uh, uh, Sancho Panza and, and Don Quixote fighting the, the windmills. Um, but as I said, it's the, the common society, the today's society does not only deal with, with the issues that we are discussing today. It's a much wider, much more complex challenge that deals also with natural uh, phenomena uh, and also with political based, uh, I wouldn't say phenomena, but decisions. And we need to take uh, into account all of them if we want to address our societal uh, future in, in the future. Thank you. That was really, um, again, a very critical point. We don't think about politics so much, right? In that interference. Or rather, it is one extreme to the other. It's only politics or it's only non-politics. So I think making sure that you take into consideration everybody really matters. Uh, and, uh, thank you so much, Marco, for, for pointing that out. Um, I would uh, like to current, invite... Current, yes, uh, yes. Just, just wanted to come in because, uh, you know, we wanted solutions. And Dr. Marco Komak is actually uh, leading uh, a company called uh, Contactum. Uh, and he, he has the solution in looking at uh, seismic activity. And Contactum has come up with a predictive modeling on earthquakes. So uh, I would request him to speak for another two minutes and then you know invite all those people who are interested to come in and then interact with him because he can predict earthquakes uh, epicenters, uh, you know, magnitude, and also when it can happen based on ionosphere, based on what is actually happening in the uh, in the seismic activity. So he will also talk about the omega theory, and then some links are there which he will talk about. Maybe I request uh, Dr. Marco to kindly share in brief two minutes, three minutes. Yeah, thanks. Absolutely, absolutely, please. Thank you, Professor Vinat. Uh, I I needed uh, a starting point to open uh, <laughs> the content that we do because the whole talk has been uh, has been around the climate change while as i said uh, we are not dealing with the climate change we're dealing with another uh, natural uh, phenomena that's earthquakes and the team that uh, i have the pleasure and uh, honor to lead has developed uh, forecasting models for earthquakes and that is uh, not only on a general and, and temporal and spatial general scale, but actually quite precise uh, with two months uh, forecasts with resolution of one day and very locally high resolutions uh, forecast. So that's something that, that I think it's, uh, it's very, uh, has a good potential to be used in the future. Uh, and I, I should add that this was only available now that we have this uh, computer power uh, in our hands. And it's something similar with other domains, the ones that you focused on today, like climate change. Uh, and this data mining and our Sorry, we lost you. Yeah, yes, we just close it. Oh. Okay. You're kindly uh, welcome to join us at uh, the designated time. Uh, but I also encourage others that are dealing with the climate change to try to think how this technology and the capability can be used uh, to actually come to the very um reliable but again uh, achievable solutions that's most important yeah, Marco, i think you bought in the uh, one more point is on the disaster because we have been talking more about climate you're absolutely correct um am i freezing 
Can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. So I think you you brought the focus back on the disaster. May I please request if you could put some kind of links or information that would be of value to the whole group in the chat box because I think that will definitely be something we need to think about it a lot more. Yeah. Thank you. So if I could do that. Thank you. Uh, I will. Thank you so very much, um, Mr. Kumar. Hello, I, 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 I want to Sorry. add some. I want to some uh, add some words. Yes, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I'm uh, just uh, uh, listen about uh, diversity protection. So you know, uh, in China, we have uh, more than fifty years experience for the protection of diversity. So and, uh, I hope later maybe uh, uh, just uh, the professor said uh, they have uh, a lot of the experience of protection of diversity. And later we can uh, establish the uh, connections of the cooperation with Chinese experts in this area. Maybe I think maybe uh, India also, there's a lot of earthquake. So maybe we can, uh, for the earthquake prediction and uh, emergency response, and also use our teams, we can uh, connect uh, one uh, uh, black, uh, 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 big platform and works together. That's my comment. Yep. Thank you so very much. And again, you know, I would request you as well as all the other uh, speakers in the past as well, if you have, uh, because we are coming to a close, and as I said, we want to keep this conversation going. Of course, in two hours, it's not possible to find solutions, but at least if we can unearth potential synergies that we can explore post this um, you know, conversation, I think that in itself is half the battle one. So if you could post some links or any kind of contact information that you feel uh, would be great for people to have or materials, then just please put it in the chat box and we definitely hope to continue these conversations and great insights from all of you uh, further. Um, Mr. Kumar, I thank you very much. You've been extremely patient and, and please uh, over to you. But really quick because we've come to 4 30 and uh, we should be looking at wrapping up as soon as possible but over to yeah you. just just one point that i need needed to make uh we're all talking about future strategies i mean we've already grown enough i mean any new strategy or any new activity that we take up is only going to consume more resources we should actually seriously start thinking in terms of degrowth, reducing our resource consumption, because only then will we be able to roll back the ravages which excess cons consumption has caused us. So step back from growth, look at development. How can the existing growth be distributed more uniformly across the globe? Can the global north start thinking in terms of making sacrifices? They've been greedy far too long, yet I don't hear a single voice from the global north saying that we are ready to reduce consumption. Unless that happens, we have no, I mean, all this talk is what it is, only talk. We need to see action and the action has to come from the global north. The global north has to reduce its consumption. No two ways about it. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mar. Yes, definitely. Uh, there's a lot of action required. And I think one of the earlier speakers also said this, that it's our individual responsibility as well. So there is an organizational, institutional, political, yes, but there's also a, a, you know individual responsibility. So thank you for pointing that out, that there is a need to reduce consumption. Um, is there anyone else who is uh, who would like to say a few words and come in? That would be really, really great. Uh, before we start looking at wrapping this up and closing. And I'll hand it over, of course, to uh, Santosh and uh, Professor Menon to do that. Uh, we are almost coming to the end. So I will just, uh, perhaps before we, uh, before we uh, formally close in terms of the last submission and the, uh, this thing from this conversation by, uh, by Santosh. And is Sanjay here with us, Santosh? We'll be talking, yeah? Uh, uh, no, he's, he's uh, he couldn't join the oh, round table. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I will leave it to Professor Menon and Santosh in terms of a summation. But I do want to just say uh, we do have a LinkedIn group for all the RISE uh, 
uh, Rise World Summit attendees to keep in touch with each other. And we'll share that LinkedIn, uh, you know, um, group information in the chat as well. Uh, also, as I said, you know, we will continue this conversation in multiple frames. So anybody who would like to do, uh, you know, from a collaborative, yes, thank you, Professor Man. I am going to hand that over to you to even expand further more on that uh, in terms of collaborations that we can have. Also, I just want to, and if we could have that slide up uh, really quick about um, the SDGs. I think one of the things that I really uh, tend to push, and one of the reasons we started the Rise World Summit was to make sure that every conversation looks at the SDGs as a whole, rather than as you know individual 17 blocks. As I love to create that an analogy that, you know, why this is how it is typically presented, the reality is it's this tight wooden, uh, you know, woolen ball of 17 colors of wool that are tightly wound up and inter interlinked. And so when any solutions are being designed or any conversations are being held, you know, can we push people to start looking at it from multiple lens, you know, and that tends to not happen. We tend to fix and say, okay, we are talking of climate action. And then it remains there, right? I mean, how much more can we interlink and you know have it as cross-cutting issues that we bring into the conversation to make sure we do? So we just you know, we just like to remind everybody about this. All of you are great experts in your field. All of you are working on programs, projects that can have far-reaching impact in our world. And so I just want to challenge you to do that. But how many of the SDGs do you look at every time you design something? And if you can do that, I think our task, at least at the Rise World Summit, has been achieved a great deal. Um, with that, I'm going to stop and close. And I'm going to ask uh, Professor Menon and Santosh to please do the summation and uh, close the uh, session uh, with, with the final way forward. Santosh, over to you. Uh, thank you, um, Karan, and thank you, Menon. So, um, <clears throat> I think amazing uh, uh, would be the word uh, to, uh, to try to sum up the, the discussion we had in the last two hours. Uh, I think the kind of uh, knowledge, the kind of uh, uh, experience we have on climate or or disaster uh, uh, planning and and the range of solutions to the the challenges we put forward uh, is also in in there in the room. Uh, so uh, I think I will um, uh, though, though we 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 started with uh, with multiple challenges starting from uh, informations to uh, policy gaps at the um, at the different levels. Uh, and and with the journey took us to uh, different kind of solutions, uh, both locally, uh, nationally, regionally, uh, th that could really address uh, the, the resilience questions which climate change and disaster uh, is asking uh, time and again. Um, uh, we also heard from um, uh, youth groups, uh, amazing and very wise words um, uh, from, from our from our youth. Uh, about the climate and and their role and their involvement uh, with the climate uh, uh, narrative uh, is also really awe inspiring. Uh, hopefully, uh, it will bring bring in some kind of uh, uh, tangible changes uh, in in the narrative, and it's happening. We see. Um, uh, locally and at the national level as well. Uh, so engagement with youth groups, I think that if we, teach, if we talk about the way forward, um, uh, I think engagement with youth groups, I think comes up uh, first uh, in terms of way forward, uh, that we continue with, uh, with engaging with them and, and, and create green jobs for, for as Sarabjit sir was, was talking about. Um, I think we, we also came uh, heard that we, we we need to listen more. I think that the multiple uh, solutions which we have already in the table, the knowledge we have gathered since our uh, uh, since start of the, uh, the, uh, the the issues, uh, I think we need to package them uh, really uh, uh, carefully and and provide that information which is really available to communities to decision makers so that uh, uh, the the risk. Um, management practices uh, could be really taken forward. Uh, I think uh, those information dissemination um, uh, is kind of very much required uh, for, for, for disaster and kind of uh, climate resilience, um, build, building of resilience. Uh, we, we also heard about in, uh, I words. we heard about integration, we heard about inclusion. 
um, more and more, uh, since these are the ways by which we 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 gather uh, we we gather forces to uh, really uh, face the challenges of climate and disaster management. Uh, we also uh, heard about the, the different capabilities like the disaster management, the earthquake. Uh, um, it has been, early warning has been our, our strength, uh, really in Odisha and other Eastern states of India. Uh, early warning really saved lives. So hopefully early warning for earthquakes also uh, really could save millions of lives uh, worldwide. So that would be really, really uh, good to see that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, someone also mentioned about political support, which is really uh, necessary uh, for for taking that forward, taking the knowledge, taking the information forward, and bringing different stakeholders together. Uh, so um, yeah. So that also comes uh, really handy when we have political support at, at different levels uh, to work with. Um, different levels yeah uh, so um, pretty much uh, this is the summer up there is many more uh, solutions which are which i i might have uh, uh, already hopefully uh, dr menon sir uh, yeah such so, so over to you sir yeah thank you very much i think uh, we have more people raising hands now but uh, you know i'm sure that the current uh, two minutes for me to just wrap up absolutely absolutely okay and thank you very much actually uh, climate resilience and disaster resilience uh, both are very related and at the same time you know we need to really look at partnerships the sdg 17 on partnership is the most important uh, as what i feel uh, all the other uh, you know sdgs are important but partnership is most important because that is what is actually connecting all the dots and that is one reason why people like Dr. Marco uh, offered that, you know, they will interpret the data related to seismic activity in the Himalayas. You know, it's actually going to affect Nepal, it's going to affect Bhutan, it's going to affect India, Pakistan, Afghanistan. And so we are actually working with uh, uh, Dr. Marco and his team in trying to interpret data with the government of India's agencies. So we've had some discussions in the past, and then, you know, we have set up a core group with uh, scientists uh, civil engineers, structural engineers, and geotechnical engineers from uh, IITs, from the Wadi Institute of Himalayan Geology, the National Center for Seismology, and others with the Government of India's Ministry of Earth Sciences. And we feel that actually that is the way in which we will be able to help each other and save lives. You know, because saving lives has become so important. And COVID-19 has shown this. We have Prabhu Roy here who has set up a portal on COVID-19, along with many of our future is in terms of basically working together. I would like to just thank everybody, uh, thank Kansa and uh, teams and all the distinguished uh, experts who have uh, you know, joined from different parts of the world across time zones. Thank you all very much. And thank you for all the distinguished delegates who stayed on. And we look forward to more connections connecting with each other, pinging each other. And uh, most of the people in India know, and some of our friends who are abroad know that I have been working in disaster management in the government of India, the National Disaster Management Authority. And whatever Colonel Dave said, I worked with uh, General Vij, who was the Army Chief, and also General Bharadwaj, who was the DG Armed Forces Medical Services. And so we realized that, you know, having worked together 16 years ago with the, with the people in the armed forces, working with the National Disaster Management Authority, working with state disaster management authorities, we know that ultimately working with stakeholder groups, with communities is so important. So thank you all very much. Stay safe. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, RISE team, and all the people in the, uh, the volunteers who've been helping us and all those people who have been tracking the, the discussions in the chat. And I look forward to really tracking all these uh, discussions in the chat. Thank you very much.